the name? Jesus. 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 Thank God. I guess I should put switch microphones. May God be praised. Again, you can sit, sit, stand, but relax on your sofa. <laughs> Whatever will help you to listen to what God may want to say to us today. And um, <clears throat> the title for today's message is I Fear God Whom I Trust. And that may sound like an oxymoron, but two opposite phrases. I fear God whom I trust. Now, hopefully, as we go through the message today, you'll see how meaningful that is, is that what it means to both fear God <coughs> to have such great awe and respect and honor for him, and what it means to trust him. Because when we really understand who he is, then we understand he's worthy of our trust. I fear God whom I trust. I think sometimes uh, we need to watch out because we may get so buddy-buddy with God that we take him almost for granted. And God is so much greater, more awesome than that we can imagine. Why else would the 24 elders bow down night and day in heaven, bowing down and say, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Worthy of glory and honor and power and praise. And we get kind of worn out in our, just our few minutes here, don't we? <laughs> or, or online. Psalm 34, we're going to go back to uh, where we kind of began this series, uh, I Will Not Be Afraid. And the theme verse that we've been using is from 34, Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. As I look for God, and if I really get my eyes on him, God will take away the focus of the fears. In fact, isn't that one of the keys to getting rid of fear or anxiety is quit thinking about the thing that's causing you that fear. Quit thinking about the thing that's causing you that anxiety. You want to have a great anxiety attack? Just sit there and worry, okay? And, and, you, and you'll have a wonderful anxiety attack. Now, I apologize for those of you who have had anxiety attacks that come on without any, any kind of reason or understanding. But the, but the fact is, is that even our anxiety attacks they're coming from thoughts that we have that we need to stop. That's Philippians 4 all over. And rejoice in the Lord always. And the whole verse there gets on to verse 8 and 9, where it says to think about things that are good and pure and honorable and just and excellent and praiseworthy. But, but let's go on in Psalm 34 and, and try to focus on what this means to fear God. Because verse 5 says, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. All those things that he was afraid of. And by the way, you remember the context of Psalm 34? This is David. He has just been kicked out by Achish. Uh, Achish, who is, uh, uh, the, the, in your Bibles, you, you have probably another, another title for him um, uh, because he's actually uh, the Babylonian king there and he's a, he's a ruler, and, and he's kicked out. And, excuse me, not Babylonian. You, you look it up, you find out. Somebody get me the right answer on that, because I'm not looking at the text. <laughs> but but he, he ha he's running from King Saul. <laughs> king Saul wants to kill David, because he's, he knows that David's supposed to be the next king. So he wants to get rid of him. So not only is he afraid of King Saul and kind of trying to flee from him for his life, but he's also now, he, gets, he goes to this group of people. Um, you remember a guy named Goliath, whom he killed? <laughs> well, Achish is Goliath's ruler. <laughs> and, and he's going to them, uh, the Philistines, and, and he's asking for protection. And they say, wait a second. Yeah, you're David. Oh, no. And, and they're just about to kill him. And so he starts acting like a crazy man. So it's going into convulsions and slobbering at the mouth, foaming at the mouth. And, and so finally, King Achish says, you, 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 what did you bring this fool here for me? You, do you think I have to waste my time with a man like this? And so he kicks him out, sends him away. And it's the way that God protects David by, by him acting like a fool. 
Yeah. And so now he's left Achish, he's also left, he's still hiding in a cave from King Saul, and, and yet he's, we, he's singing Psalm 34, praising God. And when you really understand the context of what David was going through, for him to be moving from such anxiety, literally about to be killed, and he's going out, and now he's like, you know, yay God, I praise you. Uh, you've protected me from my fears, from my troubles. Praise you, God. It goes on, verse 6. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Who's the poor man? Future king of Israel, David. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear, fear him. And he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And now he's going to say again, fear the Lord, you, his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, I know the Bible tells us many different places, do not be afraid. But that's not what he wants us to understand here with God, is it? Now, it's, what's interesting about the word fear, I don't think I can read upside down. What's interesting about the word fear is the exact same word that's used for don't be afraid is the word that's used here, fear God. The exact same word. Friday, a Ventura County state judge issued a temporary restraining order to Pastor Rob McCoy of Godspeak Calvary Chapel Church, prohibiting the church from meeting under Governor Newsom's unconstitutional COVID-19 no singing and no worship orders. Uh, Liberty Council does not represent the church, but is working with the pastor and his legal counsel. The state court order. The state court order also names does one through a thousand. That's John Doe, Jane Doe, George Doe, Virgie Doe. You know, okay, right about that. All, all does one through a thousand. Meaning, the injunction includes every person who attends the church or who will will attend the church. Anyone who dares visit the church to worship could be held in contempt of court. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. How many of you have actually read the Chronicles of Narnia? I want you to think about that if you have. They're a great book. They're, they're, uh, Lewis, C.S. Lewis wrote the book for children. <laughs> really good for adults, too. <laughs> Very interesting book. And um, in, in the, what's sometimes referred to as the first book, I think it's actually number two, but it's referred to as the first book, um, is a conversation between Susan, one of the little children that is going through the wardrobe, and, she's, and this is where we're learning about the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, and the children are going to meet Aslan. And Susan is with, uh, by the way, the animals on, in, in that country talk. Narnia, they, they talk, right? Um, until, unless they get you know, harmed by people. But, but they talk just like people do. And so, so Susan says, who is Aslan? Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. It is he, not you that will save Mr. Tumnus. That's a, a fellow, a, I forget what kind of animal that has actually been turned into stone, so obviously can't talk, and is with the, with the wicked witch. It is, it is, is he a man, asks Lucy, that's Susan's older sister, younger sister, excuse me. Aslan, a man, said Beaver so sternly, certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, 
the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. <laughs> then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king. I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter. That's the older brother. Even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. C.S. Lewis is trying to help us to understand what it means to fear the Lord. Aslan if you haven't read the books, represents Jesus Christ. Later in that book, Aslan will actually die. Be placed on an altar and give his life. And then in the final chapter, rise from the dead. I said he represents Jesus Christ. James Kaufman spoke about this verse. I will teach you the fear of Jehovah. And he made this statement. David was a famous musician, a statesman, and a great soldier. But he does not say, I will teach you to play on the harp, <laughs> or, or how to handle the sword or the spear, or how to draw the bow, nor to know the maxims of state policy. But I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The knowledge that David here proposed to teach the young is the best knowledge of all. It is better than knowing all of the sciences, all of the arts, and all of the secrets of making war. Today, many a learned man is simply an ignoramus unless he also knows the Lord. That means he's dumb, by the way. Fear the Lord. And, and David says, I, I want to teach you the fear of the Lord. And, and what does the Bible want to say about fear. And so I thought, well, let's run through several different passages and just try to understand this word, the fear of the Lord. Incidentally, uh, John Piper, speaking about fearing God, said, God is so powerful, so mighty, so holy, that you would not dare to run away from him, but only run toward him. Fearing God is the way you come to Jesus. You come humbly with a broken, contrite heart. We should tremble before we ever leave God. So fear the Lord. In Deuteronomy, Moses is preaching to the children of Israel before they go in to the promised land. And in fact, if you know anything about Deuteronomy, it's actually three different sermons that Moses preaches to the people, getting them ready before he turns the reins of leadership over to, to Joshua. In Deuteronomy 6, an important passage talks about the great commandments. In verse 13, it says, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Verse 24, The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. Moses is saying, look, these commandments that he's giving, they're so important that you need to respect God, be so afraid of maybe failing God, afraid of leaving God, that you're going to remember these commitments that you made here in this place. He goes on in Deuteronomy 10. And now Israel, who does the Lord your God ask to you? What, excuse me. What does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. In fact, verse 20 continues with that thought. He says, fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. Again, in chapter 31, right at the end, near the end of the book, it says, Verse 12, assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your town so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord 
your God and follow carefully all the words of his law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And then Joshua leads the children of Israel across the Jordan River and he challenges them Remember this day as you cross this river. And in Joshua 4, it says, He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. He gets into the land. They, they've defeated most of, the, most of the enemies there in the land. And as Joshua comes to the end, he brings the people together again one more time. And he says, okay, look, who are you going to serve? Choose this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And in that, that statement, he says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Are you starting to see a, a thread here of what it means to fear the Lord? Part of what it means to fear the Lord is to remember what God has done. And not just remember but let what God has done for you change the way you continue to live. To fear the Lord means you're, not, you're going to obey what he's taught. You're going to serve him. You're going to do his will above all others. First Samuel, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if, you both, if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good, Samuel's anointing the first king of Israel. The people have begged, you know, we want to be like everybody else. Not too smart, by the way. And so, okay, we, get, we want a king too, because that's going to make us special. Really? I thought you were special because you had God. And Samuel doesn't want to do it, but, but God says, no, you need to go ahead. So he, he's anointing Saul, and then he says, he goes on, he says, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. And there's several other texts which talk about the people fearing Lord. And by the way, the word for fear also is translated revere or respect. To hold in awe. 2 Chronicles 17.10 says, The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah, so that they did not go to war against Jehoshaphat. It's, it's common fear, isn't it? And then look, the, the kings around Israel, when Jehoshaphat is ruling, they were afraid of Israel. Just like, you remember, Rahab says, the spies are there with her, and she tells the spies, we're frightened, we're scared to death of you guys coming because we've already heard what you did. And what she repeats is, we heard what God did for you 40 years before when you crossed the Red Sea. We've been waiting here for 40 years, trembling at our knees, wondering when you're going to get here and what you're going to do, and we're scared to death of you. That's the same word for fear. Isaiah asked this question. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? By the way, are you hearing it? That obedience comes along with the word fear, doesn't it? Again and again. But the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. Jeremiah asks on behalf of the Lord, should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. And I understand that some of you have this wonderful image of this Father God, and you want to climb up in his lap and sit there and just enjoy it. And be that little child and just sit there in his arms. And that's a wonderful view of God, the Abba Father, the dear Daddy. But there's another view that God wants us to have of him that is much greater than that, more awesome and powerful. 
In fact, did you know that in the Old Testament, that, it, that the scriptures actually warn us to prepare for the coming of the Lord, that it may actually not be a good day, but it's actually a frightening day? In Isaiah 59, verse 19, Isaiah says, From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory, for he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. Incidentally, in the Old Testament, they only expected one coming, and so he was going to come and do everything all at once. We understand from Christ that, that no, Christ is, has, comes once to die, and he comes again to judge. There's a second coming. Daniel kind of starts, starts seeing this, but it, but, it, but it changes it. God changes, or I should say clarifies what he's going to do. Joel 2, 31 says, the sun will be turned to darkness. Is that when Jesus is born? No, it's when he comes again. And the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, think back on sometimes that you've been afraid. And now I'm going I'm to caution you. I know that there are some of you that are way more spiritual than I am, and you're going to say, I'm never afraid. The Bible says don't be afraid, right? Right? Why? However, <laughs> the fact is, fear is normal. It's what you do when you're afraid. It's whether you hang on to that fear. It's whether you stay afraid. It's the actions you take that God's trying to transition with us. Now think about it. Wasn't Adam afraid? When he's walking in the garden and he's naked and he hears God coming. And in Genesis 3 it says, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Wasn't Abraham afraid when he's traveling through the countryside? Now what is he, like a hundred something or like that? And he's got this beautiful, gorgeous bride. And he's afraid, and, and she's like in her 90s, okay? So girls, you know, think about that. You know, you, you, can, can you be that beautiful, right? That, you know, that your husband will be afraid of what, of what you know, the, the other kings and leaders are all going to think. And, and, and he was afraid that they would take his life because she was so gorgeous. Debbie, you are beautiful. <laughs> he's afraid. So i gotta, I gotta, I got to protect myself. So he says, she's my sister. And then he has to confess, well, she's my wife. Genesis 26, yeah, yeah, she's my wife. Genesis 42, as they were emptying their sect, isn't this another time where people were afraid? The, the brothers of Joseph. I don't know why they were afraid. They, you know, they were going to kill him, and they chose not to. I mean, they're nice guys, right? So, I mean, they only sent him into slavery to a strange land down in Egypt. I mean, why, why would that cause him to be upset with them? And dad has died, so what's the big deal? I mean, he's already done wonderful things for them, but they're afraid that he's going to harm them now because dad's dead. They're frightened, and they, and they come to him, and, you know, and as they were emptying their sex, oh, oh, oh this one also, they're, they're, they've left Egypt. And as they're leaving Egypt, they're driving down the road, that, well, walking with their camels. Anyways, they're, they're, they're going down the road, and they stop, and, and one of them gets into one of their bags to get some, some grain out, and a, we're dead meat. All of us have our cups that we gave to Egypt. All of us have our money. We're in big trouble. And it says that they were frightened. Same word, fear the Lord. Deuteronomy says when you go to war, you're against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid. Because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. And shall say, Here, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. Same word, fear the Lord. Remember Gideon? You remember, he's getting ready for a battle that he says, I'm not prepared for. You know, I'm a low guy. I'm sitting, come on, God. I'm in a wine press hiding. <laughs> you know, what kind of guy am I? And, and God says, no, you're, you're my chosen God. You're, you're my chosen guy. And he says, okay, how about if we um, get some guys around here and let's go fight the Midianites, right? And he says, oh, really? 
And so they gather as a whole about 30 some thousand together. And he says, God says, Gideon, you got too many people here. <laughs> too many guys. So he says, tell, ask the people, if anyone's afraid, let them go home. And what happens? So 22,000 men left. Well, 10,000 remain. Now, if you continue on with the story there with Gideon, you remember what else happens? He, God says, I'm sorry, <laughs> Gideon, there's still too many to fight. So he says, so he takes them down to the water, and he'll take that 10,000 and get it down to 300 guys. It's Elisha's servant. Elisha's servant who has been watching, and Elisha has been running from the king who wants to kill him, and he's really getting, uh, he's in big trouble because Elisha has been telling the king of Israel where the king of Aram is. And how does he know it? Because God's been telling him. And so the king of Aram says, okay, I want to know which one of you guys in my court here is a spy. It's none of us, it's none, because King of Aram's going to kill the guy, right? <laughs> it's none of us, it's none of us. It's, it's Elisha the prophet who keeps telling the king of, of Israel where you're at. Good then, and he muscles this huge army to go to attack the little village where Elisha is because he's going to kill one guy. <laughs> Big army, kill one guy. So if you're Elisha's servant, how would you be feeling if you look out there on the field you wake up in the morning, and you say, oh, no, there's thousands of soldiers surrounding us. We're in big trouble. And he comes in, Elisha, Elisha, what are we going to do? And Elisha says, do not be afraid. And then he makes this simple little prayer. He says, God, help him to see the army that he cannot see. And Elisha's servant looks out again. Now he sees an army more vast than the army of King Aram, who eventually will actually destroy them, and it's the army of God. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You see, fear of God means understanding how awesome God is. Exodus 15, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory? That's the word fear. Awesome in glory, working wonders. It's Deuteronomy chapter 10 again. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. And goes on verse 21. He is the one you praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. The children of Israel, man, they've had all kinds of stuff that's happened, right? They're being bought out of slavery. They've had all the plagues that have occurred there. They've seen the Passover. They've walked across the, the dry ground on the Red Sea. They've seen the soldiers of, of Pharaoh die in the water. All these things they've witnessed. And now Moses is saying, he's the one who's awesome. The God who set us free. What else does it mean to fear the Lord? I mentioned earlier the word to revere, to have reverence for. In Leviticus it says, Each of you must respect your mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. The word they respect, revere, fear your mother and father. Ob observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. Have concern for the place where I meet with you, for I am the Lord. In verse 32, it says, Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. Again, same word, fear the Lord. It's Leviticus 26, 2. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Observe the commands of the Lord, Moses said, walking in obedience to him and revering him. It's Deuteronomy 13, 4. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. Are you hearing it? To revere him, to respect him, to have all for God, to fear God, it involves obedience 
and service. And what's another word for that? Well, another word for all of what we've been describing? Worship the Lord. Worship. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. They're going through the motions. Maybe that's some of what God's doing right now with the commandments, the instructions, the governor's rules, not to gather, not to sing, really not to worship. Maybe God's separating those who really want to worship God from those who don't. Think about it. When you are afraid, when you are afraid, you are worshiping fear. Psalm 23, verse 4. Same word again. Even though I walk through the, val the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I will fear no evil. What if you put in the place of the word there that we've used as fear, some of the other words used for this exact same Hebrew term? I will worship no evil. Even though I walk through the, the darkest valley, the most frightening valley, the valley of death, even if I'm in the middle of that, even if I'm getting declared I've got COVID, whatever it might be, if I'm walking in that terrible moment, I will not worship evil because God is with me. Amen. I Amen. will not be afraid because Amen. God is with me. Spot on. And may I just warn you, it's what Jesus said, that we need to fear the thing that is most frightening. And it's not the one let me read to you Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Jesus said it again in, in Luke 12. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. Uh, once you're dead, they can't harm you anymore, right? <laughs> they can torture you beforehand, you know, take the skin off your body, all those other kinds of painful things. They can do all kinds of things that hurt you. But once you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> but he says, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. What did First Peter say? Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. And honor the emperor. And incidentally, I think that's the order. I think you're supposed to fear God before you honor the emperor. Amen. In Revelation 14. Revelation 13. The beast has come out, and, and oh my, it's terrible that the beast is taking over, and the, and the, and the prophet of the, of the beast has come to life, and, and it's bringing the beast and the statue of the beast back alive, and it's speaking and talking, and anyone who doesn't worship the, the statue of the beast is going to be killed right then. And, and in addition to that, they're going to put a number on everybody's right arm and on their forehead. And that number is the number of man. It's a number 666. And, and without that number on your forehead or on your wrist, you're not going to be able to buy food or, or eat or anything like that. And, and then we come to chapter 14 of Revelation. It says, he said in a loud voice. <laughs> this is after all the bad in chapter 13. He said in a loud voice. Fear God. And give him glory. Because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, 
from the springs of water. I want you to pray about what does it mean today for you, for you, to fear God. To truly hold Him in high regard. To respect God. I know we're just scratching the surface of what it means to fear you. I know there's an incredible blessing you've given to us that we get to come into your presence dirty and messed up and, and with all of our sins and all of our imperfections. And we're so thankful we can do that. We're so thankful, God, that because of Jesus Christ and what you did on the cross, Jesus, we can pray at any time, in any moment, wherever we're at, and you're listening. But Lord, I see that there's something more. To truly fear you. Not so we run from you, but like Ron said, Piper said, so that we run to you. To have such awe for who you are. Such <clears throat> respect that it changes every aspect of what we do, the way we live, how we act, what we, how we behave, what we say, even our language. Oh God, I pray for the fear that compels us to say, God, I've sinned against you. I'm sorry, please forgive me. The fear that causes us to humbly come to you in worship, knowing how gracious you are. God, teach us to fear you. In Jesus' name, amen.